Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good. My, my name is David Bomford. I'm the acting director of the J. Paul Getty Museum, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to this third annual Villa Council Presents program. Uh, this evening's program is made possible by the generosity of the Villa Council, one of the museum's three support councils, um, which was founded in 2001. And the Villa Council helps finance a wide variety of projects and programs here at the Villa uh, in the areas of conservation, education, and curatorial support. Um, I, the Villa Council, many of the Villa Council members are here. I won't ask them to stand, but I would ask you to give them a round of applause, please. In terms of this evening's program, I'm just going to tantalize you with a couple of quotes um, which uh, will lead into the discussion uh, that will, will happen next. Uh, and this is from, first of all, from the Wikipedia entry of the um, Antikythera mechanism, which you see on the screen there. So let me give you this quote. In 1900, a group of sponge divers, blown off course in the Mediterranean, discovered an ancient Greek shipwreck dating from 70 BC. Lying unnoticed for months amongst their hard-won haul was what appeared to be a formless lump of corroded rock. It turned out to be the most stunning scientific artifact we have from antiquity. Quote number two is from the prologue of um, uh, the book, uh, by Jo Marchant, one of our um, uh, panelists, uh, from her book called Decoding the Heavens. And she says in that prologue, in a corner of the National Archaeological Museum in Athens is something that doesn't fit. It's nothing like classical Greek statues and vases that fill the rest of the echoing hall. Three flat pieces of what looks like a mouldy green cardboard are delicately suspended inside a glass case. They've been under the sea for 2,000 years, and it shows. And next to these items, an X-ray image shows what's hidden inside. Beneath the ancient calcified surfaces, delicate cogwheels uh, of all sizes are jostling for space. Their triangular teeth, so perfectly formed, it seems that any second they might start clicking around. The design of the mechanism is, the design of the mechanism is modern and instantly recognizable, it looks like the inside of an alarm clock. And then the third quote uh, from uh, an author called Derek de Sola Price, uh, writing in the 1950s, if it is genuine, the Antikythera machine must uh, entail a complete re-estimation of ancient Greek technology. Its discovery was as spectacular as if the opening of Tutankhamun's tomb had revealed the decayed but recognizable parts of an internal combustion engine. <laughs> now, if that doesn't whet your appetite <laughs> for the discussion tonight, I don't know what will. Our first guest tonight, who I quoted just now, is Dr. Joe Marchant uh, in the center here. And Joe Marchant is a London-based journalist specializing in science and history. She received her PhD in me medical microbiology from St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London uh, and an MSc in science communication from Imperial College in London. She has written for numerous publications, including Nature, New Scientist, The Guardian, and The Economist. And after writing an article about the Antikythera mechanism, Joe decided to further explore the object and Decoding the Heavens, available from the bookstore afterwards, uh, is the book that resulted from uh, her study of the subject. Uh, it's a wonderful read. Next on our panel, sitting closest to me, is James Evans. And Dr. James Evans is the director of the program in Science, Technology, and Society and professor of physics at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma in Washington. His research interests focus on the history of science, especially Greek astronomy, and the history of cosmology from antiquity to the present. He is the author of numerous articles and publications including the history and practice of ancient astronomy, copies of which are also in our bookstore. 
also a fabulous read. Our moderator this evening, sitting on the far side from me, back for her third Villa Council Presents program, is a dear friend of the Getty, uh, Pat Morrison. Pat is journalist, broadcaster, and author, a longtime columnist and reporter at the Los Angeles Times, and the host of Pat Morrison on KPC, KPCC Radio. She was the founding host of the KCET public affairs program, Life and Times, and a founder blogger of the Huffington Post. Pat has won six Emmy Awards and six Golden Mike Awards, and was part of the reporting teams at the Los Angeles Times that won two Pulitzer Prizes. When I asked her at dinner what her um, uh, greatest achievement out of all those was, she told me that actually it was that Pink's named a vegan hot dog after her. <laughs> which, is no, which uh, if you want one, is called the Pat Morrison dog. Not to be confused with my dogs. <laughs> Uh, we're very, very pleased that Pat has joined us again to lead what I know will be a fascinating discussion. Please join me, ladies and gentlemen, in welcoming Joe Marchant, James Evans, and Pat Morrison. Thank you. I was so excited when the Getty approached me about this because over the last 15 years, there have been maybe three science stories that got me choked up almost to the point of, of being so excited about the possibilities. One of them was the news that they may have found fossilized bacteria on Mars and all that that implied. I remember I was driving down Sunset Boulevard when I heard it I actually stopped because I didn't want to miss any of it. The news of the Kennewick Man, the discovery up in your neck of the woods and all that that implied for the new world and the people who peopled it. And then there was this one. And one of the biggest mysteries about this device was how to pronounce it. <laughs> Tomato, tomato. And so I found out that Ant Antikira, wait a minute, no, I still can't do it right. Give me a, give me a hit, Jim. Well, most Americans and Britons say uh, Antikythera, but I think in modern Greek it would be Antikythera. So we'll, we'll say it the way Sophocles would understand us and see if that, uh, if that works. So, uh, but one, one thing that is not mysterious about it is that, and, and this is where I was hoping the gift shop would come in, is that um, they should have replicas of it. Because to figure it out, you actually want to hold it in your hands or give it to an eight-year-old, and that would, uh, that would solve everything. There is even, this is such an interesting and popular device that there is a, a, a website devoted to iPhone apps. It's a fan site that has listed the 10 greatest devices of antiquity, the 10 greatest gizmos that you would find in the pocket of Sophocles if he were so inclined. And the Antikythera is right there up among them. So I'm delighted that, that I can talk about that. I also, building on the idea of finding an internal combustion in uh, an engine in King Tut's tomb, to me, this device is like finding an iPod in the caves of Lasco. It, it, it ranks up there with the Great Pyramid of Giza, with Stonehenge, and some phenomenal information you're going to hear tonight about just what it represented for technology in the, old, in the ancient world why some of that technology didn't make itself manifest as the world moved forward in time and history, and what it means for us today. And so that's exactly what our guests are going to provide us with. Joe is here talking about how it was discovered. This is, this is a thriller. This is a woman who, who practiced at St. Bart's, which is where Sherlock Holmes, as you know, hung out. So if there's mystery and, and fascination, we have her and that to thank for it. Okay, so um, I know what you mean though about hearing about this and just thinking this is amazing because the first thing I thought when I heard about it was why did I not know that this thing existed? It sounds like one of those things that should be so famous and yet when there was work done on this that came out a few years ago it was very little known and why it was so little known is maybe something we can come back to. Um, but I was just going to give a very quick overview um, of how this thing was discovered. Um, so I'm going to start with a picture of this guy. Um, he is a Greek sponge diver from around the year 1900. Um, and as you just heard in the introduction, it was sponge divers that discovered the wreck that the Antikythera mechanism was found on. Um, there was a, a captain called Demetrius Kontos, and him and his uh, crew set out in two little boats from their home, which was the island of Simi in the eastern Aegean, um, the eastern Mediterranean. Um, they had sailed all the way, if you have a look on this, so it's the, uh, Simi is, uh, can I use this pointer? 
Simi is here. They had sailed all the way to here to spend the summer looking for sponges, and then at the end of the summer, they were heading back, but they were blown off course by a storm, and they took shelter here at Antikythera. Um, when the storm abated, um, one of their guys put on this clunky suit, went down, came up five minutes later, gabbling that he had seen a pile of dead, naked women and horses on the seabed. He was terrified. Um, so the captain put on the suit, went down, and realised that this was actually a pile of bronze and marble statues from ancient times. And it turned out to be the greatest hall of ancient treasure ever discovered up until that point. The Greek government ended up paying them uh, to salvage it. It took 10 months. Um, one of the sponge divers died from the bends. Two were paralysed. Um, but incredible things came up, which is still in the National Archaeological Museum at Athens. So very quickly, um, this is one of the best. It's a, a lovely bronze statue from the 4th or 5th century BC. It's called the Antikythera Youth. Um, this one is a marble boy. And you can see half of him was buried in the sand. Um, so preserved, the other half has just been eaten away by the action of the seawater. And this is my favourite, this is a philosopher's head, I think he's brilliant. But what, in all the excitement and confusion, all of this stuff was being taken back to the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. They're putting all the bits of statues together, and what nobody realised for a few months was that sitting in a crate out at an open courtyard, basically just being corroded away, uh, was this. Um, it was in one lump and then cracked open, and somebody noticed that inside there were... Um, gear wheels, uh, there were Greek inscriptions, there were scales, there were pointers, and this is not what you should f be finding from ancient Greece. This was nothing like anything else that had been found from the ancient world. Um, a, this, we now know, had at least 30 gear wheels in it. Um, so just to give you a sense, um, no other single gear wheel has been found from the ancient world. It still hasn't. No other example of a precisely marked scale has been found from the ancient and, world. And one point that Joe makes in, in her book is that this is such a singular discovery, not only then, but now, that authors like Eric von Däniken would write about it as having obviously come from aliens because humans couldn't have come up with anything like that, which in a way kind of impeded some of the scientific yeah, work that was done. Yeah, I, I think this is one of the reasons why it hasn't had the place in the history of science and technology that it deserves, because it's kind of been this oddball thing that people aren't sure whether to take seriously or not. It doesn't fit with what people thought the Greeks should have been doing, and I'm sure James can say more well, about there, that. Well, a couple of ancient texts do mention gears. Um, Hero of Alexandria described how you could make an odometer to put on your chariot. But all the things described... And they, they also told you how to roll it back, too. <laughs> all of the things described are very simple. You would never have imagined from the textual evidence that there could possibly have existed anything of this complexity. And here's the actual object as well, not just so, it, yeah. So this caused excitement, consternation at the Athens Museum, just very quickly. It's in three main pieces that are on display. So this is another one. You can see circular sort of concentric dials there. Another one, and um, I don't know if you can see here, this is the marked circular scale. It just looks really familiar. It looks like dials we have today, which is the amazing thing when you see it in the museum. Um, uh, so yeah, so that's kind of how it looks. So at the beginning, they didn't really know what to make of it. People were called in from all over Europe, um, but it's so battered you can't really see much. They knew it had gear wheels, but there wasn't much further they could get. Um, and just very quickly, um, it was kind of forgotten about because it, because it didn't fit. After the Second World War, it kind of was ignored until this guy, uh, Derek de Sawyer Price, who was quoted earlier, came along. Um, he was a professor of the history of science at Yale. He was the first to x-ray the pieces. He worked um, from the 1950s through to the 1970s. And, and just let me make a point. Jim can talk about how mm. the advances in technology have enabled the better understanding of this instead of it's just an odd lump that doesn't belong with anything. So we'll get to that with Jim, too. Yeah, I was just going to say sort of one sentence about each of these, and then we can come back to anything that we want to. Um, so he was um, the, the first to really uh, realize what the essence of this thing was. So it was to, um, he realized that it was modeling the movements of the sun and the moon, but there was an awful lot that he didn't get. Um, this guy came along, Michael Wright. Um, he still lives in Hammersmith in London. He was a curator at the Science Museum in London. He did his own set of x-rays. Um, and he's more of a, a mechanic. He makes models of things. Um, and he's made this beautiful reconstruction of what the machine would have looked like. Um, and I guess I'll just say like two sentences about what they've discovered that it was, and then I'll hand over. Um, and then more recently from Michael Wright, there's a, a multinational team involving um, British, Greek, American researchers, and they've come in. So whereas Michael kind of works on his own with his hands, this is, they're using multi-billion dollar equipment, again, to image all of the fragments and to count the teeth on the wheels, see how everything fitted together. Um, and it was a device for predicting the movements of the heavens. Um, you can see this dial on the front, there were, I mean, 
there are different ideas exactly how this was displayed, and again, James is going to talk more about this, but it was working out the movements of the sun and the moon through the sky, the phase of the moon, probably the movements of the planets. Um, there was a star calendar on there. Um, it was predicting eclipses. There was a local calendar, all kinds of things, almost like your, uh, your iPhone but in ancient times, because it was one of, you know, a box with all these different functionalities and different dials showing you different things. Um, so that's kind of a complete whiz through, 100 years of work. Um, and then, but, you know, we can... But bef before we, we get over to Jim, there, what came through in your book, too, is this device has the most seductive quality that has asserted itself over men throughout the past decades. I mean, it sounds very um, romanticized, but there is a kind of quest quality for some of the men in your book who are determined to find out, to figure out the key to this yeah. particular They advice. call it the Antikythera bug. Um, that everyone who kind of comes into this sort of gets infected and then they end up just devoting their lives to it, basically. And some of them devoted their whole lives and never lived to see the, the final answer to what this thing was and others are still working on it. But yeah, it pulls people in and then they're, that makes for a lot of rivalries as well because I think a lot of people decide that you know, they're going to be the one to, to, to come up with the answer to this thing. And I, I, I don't know what's so fascinating about it. I mean, I, I guess for me, I'm interested because it really throws into relief the similarities that we have with ancient civilizations, but also the differences. So you recognize so much about this technology, and yet what they used it for and what they thought to do with it is so different. So obviously, Jim, we were talking about the, the attraction that it exerts for so many scientists because they too are trying to fit it into the history of science as they understand it. And, and the evolution of technology. This was such an immense step forward to be followed by centuries of nothing remotely like this. Tell us about where it fits into that and actually what it does. Well, that's, that's true. It's the, the basic astronomy of it is not surprising. It's the kind of astronomy that, that Greeks and Babylonians before them knew in the second century BC. That's about when the thing was likely built. The amazing aspect of it is the, the, the cleverness and the, the economy with which all these complex relations have been realized in the form of metal gears and, and wheels. So I'd, I'd like to show you just some of the things that it does. Joe mentioned them very quickly. She mentioned also the big uh, international group centered in London and Cardiff and Athens, which put new technologies to use, uh, in new kinds of imaging technology that made it possible to get information that neither Derek Price nor Michael Wright had been able to see. So this is uh, an illustration from their very spectacular uh, article in Nature in uh, 2006, I believe this one was. So the thing was about the size of a largish shoebox, and it had covers on the front and back to protect the insides. And then you can see that there was a, uh, a, front, a front face, which had a, a moon wheel that went around. And Michael Wright showed that the moon ball actually revolved and it was painted half silver and half black to show you the face of the moon. And a, a pointer that indicated the, the day and the year. Uh, on the back, there was a, a dial which gave you uh, information about uh, the Greek calendar then in use, and then the bottom dial gave you information about eclipses. One of the most spectacular finds of this big group led by uh, Mike Edmonds and Tony Freeth is that um, the device represented the fact that the moon doesn't go around the zodiac at a constant speed. It actually speeds up and slows down in the course of the month. And this was accomplished uh, in the mechanism with this very clever four-wheel uh, mechanism, four epicyclic wheels, they're called, because they ride on other gear wheels. So this was quite, quite surprising. On the back, the top, the top dial gives a, a calendar in terms of uh, the lunisolar calendar that in use in most Greek city-states. Um, the Greek calendars kept track of the moon, so their months began on the day of new moon. So they alternate between 29 and 30 days, so the calendar will stay in sync with the moon. And then the year has to either have 12 months or 13 months, so you don't get too far out of step with the sun. And uh, it's all based on a cycle called the Metonic Cycle. They're 235 months by the moon. It's the same thing as 19 years by the sun. So save your calendar for 2010 if it has dates of new and full moons marked on it. Because in 2039, you'll be able to use it again for the, <laughs> the new and full moons. 
the, uh, a couple of ancient writers had mentioned the details of the scheme for the leap days and so on, but historians of science had completely poo-pooed this report by a writer named Geminus back in the first century BC, saying it was impossibly complicated. But there it is, it's, it's right there in the mechanism. So each of these little blocks is a month with its name in Greek, and all of the months on this row have one day removed from them, so they would be 29-day months. And the ones without a little letter there are 30-day months. So it's just as, as Gemini said, the guy wasn't making it up. And the, the bottom dial gives you uh, eclipses, both solar and lunar eclipses. But again, it's based on a, uh, a well-known Babylonian cycle called the, the Saros. If you have a, an eclipse of the moon right now, you could expect to have another one 223 months from now, which would have the same sort of circumstances. This, this was so sophisticated. I mean, we think of, of the Greeks, the ancients, gee, you know, great statues, love that democracy, but you know, not exactly in their pitching when it came to technology. Was that an obstacle from the beginning for people even to take this seriously as, as, as substantial and sophisticated as it was? You mean uh, modern historians uh -huh. looking at it? I think so. When first proposals were made, often they were dismissed as being too, too incredible to be, uh, to be believed. But the evidence is now so overwhelming. The sophistication is really there. Again, the astronomy itself isn't surprising. It's the astronomy that we know people were studying in that period. It's that all of it was put into this one package in this one box, this one, this one iPhone, with so much economy and so much elegance of design that really blew people away. I think it also falls between different disciplines because you've got your, your experts in antiquity who tend to be classicists who are interested in the art and the, the sculpture and the, the, the textual sources and they don't necessarily have the sort of mechanical or scientific expertise whereas the people that do don't know anything necessarily about the ancient world so th those two have never really had to come together before so it's why a lot of the work, this work has been done either by amateurs or people who've kind of that you wouldn't expect coming in from outside working alone rather than being necessarily mainstream historians. Um, Jim, Joe was mentioning the x-ray work that was done, the kind of initial work. What other technological advances were brought to bear to make this rendering and these understandings possible? The, uh, the big team uh, centered in Cardiff, London, and Athens managed to get um, support from a couple of high-tech corporations which invented new technologies that were first applied to this mechanism. One of them is x-ray tomographic imaging so that you can actually take slices basically every tenth of a millimeter. When Derek Price was working back in the 1950s through the 70s, he had x-rays, but you have a jumble of gears all fused into one glob and you couldn't really see so well what was on top of what. Another uh, new technology was invented by a guy named Tom Mousebender at Hewlett Packard. And this is a really neat little gizmo. Um, maybe Joe will show you a picture of it later. Um, you have a, a dome with 50 different flash bulbs on it, and you put the object in the middle, and you're photographing it with a regular um, electronic camera, but the flash bulbs go off one after another. You ah, take the paparazzi technique. Exactly. <laughs> and then with we computer well. software, in real time, you can dial around the lighting direction so that each individual letter in the inscription, you can have the lighting angle adjusted just right so that it becomes sharper. A lot of these inscriptions, by the way, are not visible on the surface because of corrosion. The writing is now actually underneath the surface. Wow. And so it was only with the x-ray tomography that people were able to bring this stuff up. And, and as Joe pointed out in her book, as people worked on it, as they were given permission to touch it, sometimes pieces would break off. Yeah, Michael Wright tells the story of how he came in and the first time he'd actually been allowed to handle it and he'd been waiting for years to see this thing and he was like really, really nervous and he turned it over and it snapped in two and he, he ran out of the room to go and tell the curator and the curator was just like, it happens to everyone, it happens to the assistant, it happens to me, now it's happened to you, go and have a drink, go home. And they stuck it back together with super glue. I don't think it was the, I don't think it was the first time this particular piece was broken. Though. Yeah, it's so corroded. I mean, there's a tiny sliver of metal, but the rest of it is um, kind of corrosion products. It's kind of very powdery, it brushes away at the touch, so wow. it's quite a scary thing. And I think that's one reason why the Greeks also are very protective of it. It's quite difficult to get permission to get anywhere near this thing. Uh, Jim, I'm thinking it's, it's as if you had like 50 years worth of farmer's almanacs that you managed to put into a single software program. Is that essentially what this does? And that people had done paperwork on the heavens for 
decades and this distilled all of that? In, in a way, it's a kind of a complete model of the cosmos as the people at the time understood it. So besides the things I mentioned, uh, Joe pointed out that it has a star calendar included so you can tell which star is rising in the east in the morning just before sunrise. All the things that were traditional concerns of, of Greek astronomy. But it also connects human, human activities with the cosmic cycles because there's a dial that represents the cycle of the Olympic Games. Um, the four-year cycle of Olympic and the other games that took place on either every two years or every four. That accounts for the NBC logo on the other side that you can't see. It does. The, um, this was a way people would reckon time. You would say something happened in the year that so-and-so was Archon of Athens. I mean the year that these two guys were uh, consuls in, in uh, Rome. And then to be perfectly clear, you would say it was in the third year of the 84th Olympiad, the year that uh, Achilleus won the, uh, the foot race. So the dating according to years in the Olympiad cycle was a part of standard chronology. And it, but it's, it's a non-cosmic thing, right? It's a human invention. So it's more than just a image of the cosmos. It's all about cycles of time and how it connects with humanity. Well, how then, given that this, as technology, this is superb and, and astronomy, it's, it's so far ahead of its time, where do you overlay the astrology, the, the, the divine aspects mm -hmm. that the Greeks clearly had invested a great deal in? The, um, the, Astrology is an interesting thing because if you had a device like this that could predict the behavior of the planets, you could presumably use it for shortcuts and casting horoscopes. But the date of the mechanism is earlier than the emergence of um, astrology in the, in the Greek world. It's probably early to middle second century BC and astrology doesn't really get going in the Greek context until the next century. So it does give a sense of human connection with the divine and the eternal but it's probably not motivated directly by astrology. Uh, Joe, as, as various generations of science-minded uh, science people and scientists worked on this, uh, did they um, imagine more than what the device delivered or were their imaginations just not up for what they ended up finding? I think the latter. Um, I mean, it, it started off at the beginning that people either thought it was a hoax or it was made by aliens or it was dropped on the wreck site by chance much later. Um, and, and then I think people were sort of added one bit at a time, like wh whenever they thought they'd got the solution and were like really amazed by it, the next person to come along found that it was actually a lot more than that. Um, so uh, Price, for example, who I mentioned, he, he uh, deciphered the gear train that calculates the movements of the, the, the sun and the moon. So you turn a handle on the side, that turns a pointer that shows you the movement of the sun through the heavens once per year, and there's a gear train that then converts that into movement of the moon. And they thought, that's pretty amazing um, in itself. Um, but then it became clear that, um, well, probably, we think almost certainly the planets were encoded as well. You had this eclipse prediction dial, and, it, and also that it wasn't just showing, um, as, as James said, the sort of constant motions. That You've got gear wheels riding around on other gear wheels, which are showing you these sort of varying motions as well. So um, every time there's kind of more. And then, yes, most recently, the Olympiad dial, which was completely unexpected, saying this wasn't just an astronomer's tool. There was all this social aspect to it as well. And uh, researchers are still reading the inscriptions. There's, there's still work going on. So I, I kind of think we haven't got all of it yet. If, if this were a, a computer program, how sophisticated would it be? I mean, if we, if we look at the evolution of the computer that, what, 40 years since the internet or the ARPANET, where in that scale would this be in terms of sophistication? Well, I, I think it was the most sophisticated bit of mechanical engineering of its period and more sophisticated than anything that was produced for an, another thousand years until we get to mechanical clocks in the early Middle Ages. And, and, and so to, on Joe's point then about how people may have underestimated as they studied this, what it was capable of doing. And only as they learned more and saw more did the, the truth really dawn on them. And the idea that you could turn a dial, that you would have the eclipses uh, predictable and all of that. So, so sci are scientists still coming to terms with the complexity of this, do you think? They are, and, uh, but it's also important to remember that it, it fits in with other aspects of ancient, uh, ancient culture because there are lots and lots of representations of astronomical and cosmic things in Greek art and, and literature. Um, at the top, we have a sundial. 
we have a, several hundred Greek and Roman sundials preserved, way more than you would need for any practical purpose. Partly it was about expressing your understanding of the way time works and the way the motions of the sun work. Uh, often there are symbolic representations. Um, the coin on the right is a, a coin from Roman Bithynia, which shows Hipparchus seated before a table with a celestial globe. One of the most spectacular examples of sundialing is in the Tower of the Winds at Athens, an eight-sided building with a sundial on each face. They all had to be individually designed. And then a, a relief sculpture of a wind god up uh, above each. And on top, Vitruvius tells us there was a, a weather vane that pointed to show you which wind god was blowing at the particular moment. <laughs> Inside, it's believed there was an elaborate water clock. So there's way more than you would need for just practical time telling. Partly it's a way of expressing you know, your sense of intellectual exaltation that humanity has understood the way the universe works. The architect is showing off. Uh, it, people are making grand statements. And the Antikythera mechanism fits in well with that aspect of ancient culture. It's a mechanics tour de force, right? The mechanic has shown what he can do. But it also it expresses, you know, the sense of human triumph that we've figured out how the, how the universe works. So it's more than something merely practical, I think. If, it, if all the information contained in it were available in a library at Alexandria, for example, or somewhere else, why even create this device? Again, I think it's the, the there was a kind of, there's a branch of uh, Greek engineering called uh, wonder working, which is described by hero of Alexandria. People would make things like a little temple on which you could build a small fire and, after, and it worked through water pressure and steam and stuff like that. And after the, the, the offering burned enough, the temple door would open and a toy mechanical god would come out <laughs> and take the coin you'd placed on the platform and go back in. And this is a branch of engineering with an actual name, you know, wonder working. And then they put the gum in it at some that, point. Well, <laughs> the gum eventually, yes, of course. But um, so, you know, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of, it's like being the best artist, being the best mechanic, be, making a better uh, piece of machinery in the same way that a, that a, um, a maker of mosaics can best the, uh, the other mosaic artist. I think there was a very strong um, spiritual and religious aspect to it as well. Um, so one of the um, one of the people who you know, there's a lot of talk about well who might have made this thing, for example, um, and there's a a text written by um, the Roman author Cicero who, who talks about a um, a bronze machine made by our friend Posidonius, who was a philosopher who lived on roads um, in the first century BC um, at about the same time that this particular ship. Um, that it was found on sailed, um, and he says that our friend Posidonius built this mach bronze machine to, to model the um, the movements of the heavens and the sun, the moon, and the planets. Um, and this was never taken very seriously, um, but because um, Cicero didn't really have any technical training, he didn't explain how this thing worked. Maybe he just made it up. He to was make a politician. Point. Yeah, uh, you know, you, you, you've, there was no other sort of corroborative evidence, but now we actually have a device exactly like this from this time from Rhodes. So. Um, one point about that, that is that when you have something like this, then you start to reinterpret all kinds of other sources. Um, but what I was going to say is that um, Posidonius was a Stoic philosopher, and for him, um, the cosmos was infused with a divine life force. So um, everything to do with the workings of the universe and the cosmos um, was about getting closer to the divine, to understanding the, sort of the workings of things. Um, so it could well be that making something like this is an embodiment of that. Um, like homage. Yeah, so, it, so it, it's not um, just a practical thing, and then there's the whole wonder aspect, but also just that, that, that real spiritual dimension to it as well. I think the spiritual dimension is a, is a real one. There, we know that on the island of Delos, in the Temple of Good Fortune, around 200 BC, whitened boards written with all of the astronomy of Eudoxus were dedicated as an offering to the temple. The boards don't survive, but we, there's an engraving of the contents of the archives of the, of the temple, which does survive. And also the greatest astronomer of antiquity, Claudius Ptolemy, in the second century, made a uh, inscription, which he set up at the town of Canopus, with all of the secrets of the motions of the planets written out on it. And it was dedicated uh, as an offering to the savior god, which to him probably meant Serapis. But here are two really nice examples of this sense of connection with the divine that comes from mastering astronomy and understanding the workings of the 
celestial wheels. But was all of that correct in the way that this is correct? It was correct in the sense that uh, it all works. And today, people tend to give the Greeks a bad name because they, they were wrongheaded about putting the Earth in the middle instead of around the, going around the sun. But from the point of view of descriptive astronomy, that doesn't really matter at all. You could always ask what the universe looks like from your point of view, and it looks like the universe that the Greeks described. So in that sense, it was all, all correct and workable. that You could really use it to predict positions of the planets. You, even today, it would work just fine. Because when I think of the Greeks and, and the sciences, I think of you know, Archimedes getting all pruny in the bathtub, mm -hmm. and, and then um, you know, Aristotle, who got an awful lot of stuff wrong. But so do we misapprehend? And is this, in a way, a missing link to, of a connection to a kind of technological wisdom that we might not have credited the Greeks with? I think it comes from the Archimedes side, because Archimedes was right. You had to get pruny in the bathtub. And Aristotle was trying to do it all of, out of his head, which you can't, you can't really get very far that way. The Antikythera mechanism has a kind of connection to Archimedes, perhaps. When the uh, Alex Jones and uh, Tony Freeth deciphered the calendar on the back, it turns out the months are in uh, a calendar related to the calendar of Corinth. All the Greek cities had different month names. Um, the most important colony of Corinth was Syracuse, which was Archimedes' hometown. So some people would like to see this as not coming from Archimedes himself, because it's a little bit too late for that, but maybe growing out of a craft tradition that started uh, in Syracuse with Archimedes. You noted something earlier about new work on the sun, apropos of this? Oh, uh, well, uh, our little research group at the University of Puget Sound has been doing work on the Antikythera mechanism, which has only been possible because the big group in, uh, in London has been very generous about sharing data and images with us. One of the questions we raised was, well, if the mechanism displays the non-uniform motion of the moon, has the moon speeded up and slowing down, is it possible that it did represent also the fact that the sun speeds up and slows down. And here, it turns out Derek Price had actually seen a clue. The top scale is a, a scale of months in the Egyptian calendar, and the bottom scale is the zodiac scale. And you can see that there are 29 uh, degrees of the zodiac corresponding to about a, the wrong number of days. Since there are 360 degrees in the circle, 365 days in the year, if everything was going uniformly, the number of degrees could never exceed the number of days, but, but here it does. And it turns out that with this uh, X-ray tomography, you can actually get underneath this, this plate with the parapegma on it, the star calendar, which has shifted out of place, and you can see more of the two scales. So there's almost a quarter of a circle preserved. And you can just match them up, so the straight line shows you the way the degrees of longitude should run, uh, that's on the horizontal axis, should run against the days elapsed if everything were represented by uniformly moving sun. And the boxes show you the way it would go if uh, the ancient mechanic were, try were trying to make use of the non-uniformity of the sun's motion. And the little triangles show you the way the dates uh, the correspondence is between degrees and days, you actually get off the mechanism. And there it is sort of blown up. If it were just mean motions, that is, the sun going around at a constant speed, that graph would be a horizontal straight line. And the, the dots show you the correspondence from the mechanism itself. And the, the curves and straight lines depends on what you assume for the underlying theory, whether it's Greek or Babylonian. But now it seems to be pretty securely established that it also has built into it a device for showing you that the sun speeds up and slows down in the course of the year. Even though they didn't have a heliocentric universe? That's right. So That's they would amazing. think of the sun as going around the Earth in the course of a year, running sometimes a little fast, sometimes a little slow. That's amazing. Well, if you don't have it running fast and slow, you'll get your eclipse times all wrong yeah. and everything. So it, so it does have accommodate. consequences. <laughs> it's like driving the 405. So, Joe, I think what everybody wants to know is, was this just a one-off? Was this just a singular device that was made for some uh, perhaps worshipful purpose by some, you know, at the behest of some rich patron? 
or to, to mollify some god? Where did it start? Where, did it, where it was going? What, what do you know about that? Well, I mean, we only have one to look at, but there are several reasons for thinking that this wasn't a one-off. Um, so one is just the complexity of it, the idea that one person kind of came up with the idea of modelling the heavens in this way and then built the Antikythera mechanism because it's, it's so elegant, the way that it's all put together and cer certain trains and wheels are kind of have double uses and it's just put together beautifully, very economically, um, that it must have been at least sort of generations of work, each, each building on the, on the next, making it slightly more complicated each time. Um, there's also evidence from text, so I mentioned the fact that Cicero had written about a machine like this built by the philosopher Posidonius. Um, Cicero also wrote about something like this that Archimedes had built, and there are other writers that write about the, the sphere that Archimedes built as well. Were they contemporaries, well. Archimedes and Cicero then? Um, so Archimedes was 3rd century BC, Cicero was 1st century BC, um, Posidonius was 1st century BC. So Archimedes was a couple of hundred years before this particular mechanism, but he could well have been um, the person who came up with the idea originally. But was he like the Edison who got credit for everything, even though he didn't? There is definitely it. some of that, like um, <laughs> everything that comes up, well, we've all heard of Archimedes, so let's say it was Archimedes, but we know that his father was an astronomer, so he might have been interested in this sort of thing. He did work with gears, and one of the, um, the treaties that he wrote, um, which is now lost, was called On Sphere Making, and sphere was a sort of a catch-all sort of term for this kind of astronomical model. So, you know, it's possible that he was involved somewhere at the beginning. Um, so you have these little mentions dotted around that suggest that this wasn't a one-off. And then the other reason just comes down to statistics. So, so little survives from the ancient world, especially things made of bronze, because this was valuable and would have been melted down and reused. Um, we only really have it because it was out of reach at the bottom of the sea on this wreck. Um, so if you look at bronze statues, for example, um, I'm sure there are people in the audience who know a lot more about this than me, but there would have been um, probably hundreds of thousands of bronze statues standing all across the Greek world. And now there are only a handful in museums. The National Archaeological Museum in Athens has one of the best collections. They have only 10, all but one of those were from shipwrecks. So it tells you something about the ratio of what there was to what we have now. So the fact that we have even one Antikythera mechanism suggests to me at least that there must have been dozens at least. I mean, a luxury item, probably not mass produced, but a whole tradition of these things, probably a the Greek world. And, and how has it changed if it has the, the, the storytelling of the history of science vis-a-vis -vis the ancient world? The, I think it changes our view of ancient technology. We realize that it's a lot, it was a lot more advanced than we would have given it credit for. It's true generally that uh, history of technology doesn't get documented as well as history of pure science or history of medicine. So in pure geometry, we have the intact work of Euclid. In pure astronomy, we have Ptolemy's Almagest and so on. But the people who did the nitty gritty stuff, who you know, made machines and perfected them in craft traditions, a lot of that stuff didn't get writ written down. It would be the same today. You know, say if you got a, a job at Microsoft and you were taking over from somebody who was going somewhere else, you would find that the notes this person left behind on the status of the project would be inadequate for you to figure out what he had done and what needed to be done next. And I think it was the same then. And it shows you how crucially important the objects are. The texts themselves just don't allow you to get a handle on the history of technology. Are there other um, artifacts from ancient technology or even medieval technology that have been re-examined as we were talking about Cicero and his writings in light of the... Well, Joe has some, some, some actually slides. some slides <laughs> that will... Funny I should ask. Yes. Yeah, let's just skip forward. Um, so this is a sundial, this is actually a reconstruction, the original is in pieces. Um, a Lebanese guy walked into the Science Museum in London in 1983 um, with the, the battered pieces of this in his pocket and basically just walked up to a security guard and said, I've got something you might be interested in. Um, and it turned out to be from around the 6th century AD, the Byzantine Empire, pieces of a sundial, which was pretty common at the time, um, lettering in Greek, um, but there were um, gear wheels. And like most people probably know a little bit about how sundials work. You don't need gear wheels on a sundial. So this is how Michael Wright got into this whole subject because he was working at the Science Museum at the time. And he and his colleague Judith Field um, worked on reconstructing it and realized that this was a sundial, but inside was a geared calendar. It was eight gear wheels, and it was showing you um, the motions of um, the sun and the moon in the zodiac. And here is the phase of the moon, and there's a little box here showing you the day of the month. So this is very similar um, 
in concept to what's happening in the Antikythera mechanism. So it's much, much simpler, only eight gear wheels, but it's doing the same thing. Um, and so that it seems that the idea, the essence of this technology, even though Roman civilization collapsed, you know, all sorts of things collapsed and a lot of the knowledge was lost, the sort of essence of this had survived into the Byzantine Empire. Um, this is the, after the Antikythera mechanism, so first or second century BC, there is nothing else like that. No, no other sort of uh, mathematical gearing, no, no other devices until this. So this is what's uh, six, seven hundred years later, and it's much simpler. This one's neat though, that it, it does have the oldest ratchet. Yep. So you can't turn So you the turn the, if I go back, uh, can I do that? There we go. Um, this is the ratchet. You can, these are the, the gods representing the seven days of the week, and it's a ratchet that turns around day by day. Uh, the beginnings of the gift of heart. It's a lovely now. thing. Um, and then the next thing, um, this is a, a manuscript or a copy of a manuscript from the 10th century AD um, attributed to a guy called Nastulus in Baghdad. Um, and this is explaining how to make something called the box for the moon, um, which was actually to be, which I think this was attached to a sundial as well. And if you look, um, these are the, the gear wheels inside and these were showing the sun and the moon in the zodiac, the phase of the moon. Um, and I think this is a box to show the day of the month. So this is, Hundreds of years later, we're now into the Islamic world, but this is exactly the same technology, exactly the same arrangement of gear wheels. So you're seeing that kind of thread continuing, that the idea survived. Um, there's another beautiful astrolabe um, from the 13th century AD that's now held in Oxford, um, which is the same, exactly the same calendar on it. And then, oh, and I just wanted to show this as well, because this is the astronomical clock in Prague. I don't know if anyone recognizes it. Um, and I think this shows that the ideas and this technology did end up coming back to Europe and had a lot to do with the emergence of, of clocks in the sort of 13th, 12th, 13th century AD because these clocks, mechanical clocks started off as these huge elaborate astronomical affairs. Telling time was kind of secondary and it was only later that they kind of shrank down and became more like the clocks we know today. And it, you can just see the similarities of the sorts of things that were displayed. So we think that this was te you know, lost technology, but actually it wasn't lost. It has, it has survived. I want to get to questions in a minute here, so if the folks with the microphones can make themselves known, if you want to raise your hands, we'll start uh, getting your questions for our microphone mavens here. And Jim, is it fair to call the Antikythera a computer? It is. It's a kind of specialized analog computer. It calculates astronomical phenomena. Uh, an ancient calculating machine, I, I think, is a fair expression for it and a really phenomenal thing, but not yet in the gift shop. Do we have some questions? It would be very pricey. Okay, here. Oh, we'd outsource it and have somebody else build it. Couldn't do it in this country. Hello. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the, uh, the technology for making the gears uh, and what you know about that, because I understand that traditionally that's, that's a very uh, difficult thing to do. The um, Michael Wright, has become quite good at, at making the gears. And has, he's shown that you can make gears by hand with any number of teeth. You don't have to worry about having bits of circles that can be divided into even fractions and so on. The gears in this period are very crude and simple. The, the teeth are triangular. So you would have scribed a, a disc out of brass and then cut it out by hand and then uh, cut and then filed the edges of the teeth, you know, one at a time. It's very slow and laborious. It's an amazing thing to think that a machine this complicated with at least 30 gear wheels could run without a lot of friction or without things slipping. And I have a colleague who's been working in my group who's made one, and we have a double of a time just keeping it adjusted and making sure that it'll work from one day to the next. It's quite an amazing thing that to see how much these guys could do with hand tools and the simple technology. But, but what is it like to set it in motion, to turn that crank on a copy of it? It's pretty fun, it is. It's, um, um, and it, it turned out actually in our research to be important to have a mechanical model because Alan was able to prevent us from harebrained uh, theories if you couldn't really realize it in practically in, in you know, gears made of brass, then you had to abandon your particular pet theory. It's always nice to have the actual clinical laboratory opportunity to test it out. So do we have somebody else? Archimedes in the bathtub. There's one, okay. I just wondered if you could say anything about the um, wreck in which 
it was found, whether the context of, I mean, what sort of cargo that ship had, obviously a lot of things would have disappeared, but um, is there any indication that it was actually used in a practical way for navigating? And does James Cameron know uh, about it? <laughs> a lot of people have, have, have suggested um, sort of over the past century that maybe it was used for navigation. Um, probably it wasn't. It, was, it seems to have been part of the cargo. Um, I don't know if I can find the map that I put up earlier. Um, Maybe I can do. Can you do that while I talk? Yes. Um, so yeah. So basically, it, it was a Roman ship. It was full of Greek treasures, um, but it was actually a Roman ship, and it um, it looks to have sailed from the east, the Asia Minor coast, and it was heading back to Rome. Um, and around this time, so it's been dated to between 70 and 60 BC, and that was by Jacques Cousteau, who dived at the site in the 1970s, and they found coins from Asia Minor dating um, to that time. And at that time, um, the Romans were basically coming down through Asia Minor, just uh, taking over all of the Greek colonies there and taking everything that they liked and shipping it back to Rome. So this would, may well have been a ship carrying war booty back home, um, or at the very least sort of uh, things that they were taking as sort of taxes or reparations that they were sending home, um, but just never made it because the ship... Since uh, there were so many grand statues of bronze and uh, marble uh, mm. in the cargo, it wasn't just... Yeah, these Probably were luxury, very expensive items, and some of the statues still had lead on their bases, um, so it's sort of where they would have been attached, so, sorry, lead on their feet where they would have been attached to the base, as if they'd kind of been wrenched down in a hurry. Um, so it looks as though, like, no one's really been able to come up with anything, any way in which the Antikythera mechanism could have been useful for navigation. The Greeks were pretty good at navigation already, so it seems that it was probably just another treasure that was part of that whole cargo that they well, were Do you think back. they just took it because it looked like it might have been worth something, or they had any idea? Well, the Romans loved um, Greek philosophy and Greek yes. technology and these sort of wondrous devices. I mean, they loved all of that. I mean, in a sort of slightly patronizing way, I think, and they didn't really do much of that themselves, but you know, they probably would have thought, oh, how, this would be a wonderful thing to show to all of my friends at the dinner party back home, that kind of thing, a way just to impress people. Um, so whether it was given to, to them as a gift by you know, Greeks trying to sort of ingratiate themselves, or whether it was taken, stolen, I, you know, we don't know. We won't know. And it happened once before, because Archimedes is supposed mm. to have built something like this, maybe not this fancy, but it was taken by the Romans after the sack of Syracuse in 212 BC and taken back to Rome, which is where Cicero's sources would have seen it. So Did it survive? No, well, nobody knows anything about it except what the Roman writers say. Wow. But maybe in the garbage dumps around Rome would be a good place to look for, <laughs> for more of them. Or the seabed as well. <laughs> Someone else? Here we go. Uh, OK, it's on. Uh, <coughs> what, I have a statement. Uh, to, what you're actually saying it is, is that this predicted the astronomical new moon uh, because it's telling the position of the sun, the moon, and the earth. So that's how it could tell eclipses. So that has to do with calendars. And, you know, <clears throat> we think calendars are lunar, but they're really solar. When you talked about the 235 moons, you're inserting seven additional lunar months into a 19-year cycle to stay in sync with the solar year. Now, the ancient people did this because they had festivals and they worshiped God with the festivals. The Samaritan Israelites claim in the fifth century BC that they got from the Jews in Jerusalem how to calculate the astronomical new moon, which has been said to be impossible. But this mechanism shows that it's not impossible because this is even beyond being able to calculate it. This is to be able to make a mechanism to mimic it. Um, so when you said that it, it even predicted the slowing down and the speeding up of the moon, so it's not giving us like the mean average of the moon cycle, right? Okay, let's make sure you don't lose everybody here. So we'll, we'll get okay. to Jim. It, it would, was there a question from yeah, your... Yeah, right there at the end. Uh, it, it's not giving us the mean average of the moon. In other words, 29, 29 days, 0. 0.53059 uh, deal. Because I found that in calendars, when you run forward using the mean, 
It's not what actually the astronomical new moon is doing. And it's, the question. It's all. Well, I'm asking you. Okay. It, it's Let's, not. I think it. Jim has, has gotten it, the gist it, of it. It does here. do both. The, the calendar dial on the back is based on mean motions, the 235 months and 19 years. But on the front, the graphic display of the motion of the moon around the zodiac does have the variable motion built into it with the moon speeding up and slowing down in the, in the course of the month. Those aren't contradictory in any way. <laughs> well, they're a little bit contradictory, but that's characteristic of the astronomy at the time, where you would use several different ways of representing something, uh, maybe in the same text and often in the same mechanism. But when they wanted to display the irregularity of motion, they were capable of doing it, and it, it's there, apparently, in the motion of the moon wheel on the, on the front face of the mechanism. Something, was there somebody? Oh, there's one here. Well, we already got a question. Maybe we can get to some other folks before we get seconds over here. Yes, for those of us who like to tinker, mm -hmm. are, is a schematic available? <laughs> the Butterick pattern? Please drive my wife crazy and say yes. <laughs> I, you know, there, there are half a dozen models, replicas that have been made ar around the world. Um, I don't think there's a schematic. There is in the Nature paper. Um, oh, yes, so there by is that. Free et al. from 2006. They give a, a gearing diagram. So it shows you oh ev boy. every gear wheel inside that, that exists that we know about and how they were all connected in the different gear trains. So that would be a good place to start. Um, there's, there's also a, a video of Michael Wright's mechanism in motion on YouTube. Um, so that also gives you a sense of what this looks like. Um, to operate. You're getting tin snips for Christmas, I guess. <laughs> how, how expensive is it to reproduce? To well, Michael Wright said that his was 100 hours of work. So, I mean, like, maybe you but can... But he's, he's a it. genius of a mechanic. Mm. <laughs> Anybody else would take 1,000 hours. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's your goal over here. Yes, in the middle. Thank you. I've seen programs on cable TV about the Antikythera mechanism and about the wonder devices, and it seems to me at this point common knowledge. And so I'm wondering, are the, is the, are the programs that we can watch on TV every night of the week now about these devices um, being dis rediscovered because of the Antikythera mechanism, or did we know about them all along and it was just um, uh, obscure knowledge? I think the, the wonder devices were kind of known about all along, um, but the Antikythera mechanism really gives you a new per perspective on it because they tended to be models of um, people and animals and steam powered and that kind of thing, um, whereas this is models of the cosmos. So it's a kind of whole other arm of that, um, that concept, if you like. So in that way, it, it is introducing kind of a whole new audience to that, I suppose, and getting people to reinterpret it. Um, in terms of the Antikythera mechanism itself, um, I think it, it was quite, you know, Arthur C. Clarke um, made a program about it in the 1980s, and then Eric von Daniken that you mentioned with his theory about the alien. So it did enjoy a certain kind of fame in previous decades, and then was kind of forgotten. And now I think it's being rediscovered um, because of Freeth and his colleagues' work and the big nature paper that they had. So now we kind of have an answer in a way. It's always been this mysterious thing, it didn't really fit, but now we know what the gear wheels did. Now we know what, you know, we don't have the answer to every question about it, but we can kind of say what, what this was. And so that's why suddenly the last two or three years you'll have seen a lot more stuff about it. Jim, what's your take on that? I, I think that's right, that people did know about the um, wonder working apparatus um, from the ancient text, but this has made people go back and look at those in a more serious way. And because now we have a physical object. That's it's right. Not People have poo-pooed anymore. them as you know, expensive toys. But now this is something really substantial. Hi. Um, you mentioned that you, you did not believe that this was the work of a, of a single individual in antiquity. Um, given the sophistication and the um, cleverness of this mechanism, and given the fact that in order to build something like that, it doesn't require intelligence, but it also requires observation and time to see how the seasons and the moon and this, as the sophisticated people said, uh, revolves. Do you think this was an act, and given the fact that in antiquity, the life expectancy was very short, it was um, an act of uh, 
one generation or several generations that they left something behind in either in a, in a primitive form of a textbook, um, the scholars and the mentor, you know, the, the students took over and they finalized this mechanism or they perfected this. Um, I mean, this is all speculation, um, but, but I imagine more rather than it being left behind in a textbook that perhaps you would have had a, a sort of tradition within a workshop or within a school, so you're having, you know, people teaching each other, so it would have been going that way. And, it, you know, my personal opinion is it would have taken several generations of, of work and perhaps of an astronomers working with um, mechanics. I mean, again, we don't know that, but, you know, maybe there, maybe there was one incredible genius who just built this out of nowhere. Um, but, but I think you would have needed both schools of, of knowledge coming together and people, you know, one person teaching the next rather than there being gaps, if that makes and, sense. And for the record, being a Greek, given the, um, the Greeks, um, uh, the philosophy, the democracy, the architecture, the mathematics, the class, uh, it's not surprising they were able to build something like that. <laughs> Well, Thank you, Dimitri. <laughs> that's, that's all very true. But we, have, we should remember that the underlying mathematics is 100% Babylonian. So the astronomical, <laughs> the astronomical cycles that all of the displays are, are based on are something that the Greeks got from the Babylonians during the Hellenistic period. Probably, you know, one person did make this machine or supervise its building, but I think Joe's absolutely right that it grew out of craft tradition, so there must have been earlier ones that were simpler, that did fewer things. Um, and you do have this combination of craft, you know, mechanic knowledge with mathematics uh, of uh, Babylonian astronomy. So it's, a, it's an amazing synthesis, several different, completely different kinds of knowledge brought together. So one person didn't invent it out of, out of thin air, but Probably it's so sophisticated and all the parts are so harmoniously related to one another. One person did sort of supervise the plan for this one particular object. What, one what do you one think, Greek, Dimitri. Did Probably one Greek, yes, I Let, agree. Let's make this our penultimate question. <laughs> this is a really low tech question. Was it a handle on the side that once a day you'd, you'd turn and adjust it or was it always moving the gears or? Well, you could, I mean, so, Probably there was a handle on the side. Um, let's see if I can get through to... And would you say, I'd like to know when the next eclipse is, or... So there's different ways you could use it. You could either wind it on each day to see what's happening today, but I think more likely you would want to know about a particular date and time, so you would wind either forwards to look at the future or backwards to look at the past. <laughs> um, there is also, it's been suggested that maybe it was driven by a water clock. So um, James mentioned that the Tower of the Winds where you would have had this big bronze astrolabe dial that was turning and driven by a water clock. So perhaps this could have been part of a display like that. I, I think that this looks more like something that would, you know, because it's small and in a box, it was more portable and something that you would have wound by hand. And if it was going to be a water clock, it would have been a much bigger display. But the principle would, would work either way. Last question. So um, this, we're saying that this, uh, uh, device was probably the, pr the result of a tradition uh, that resulted in, in this sort of construction. And around that time, the Roman Empire, uh, I believe, inv uh, conquered, in essence, the Greeks. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you could tell us something about um, whether that could have had an influence on the propagation of this knowledge or the lack of propagation. And whether there was some sort of differences in the engineering traditions of the Greeks versus the Romans, because obviously the Romans did do engineering, but did they have this sort of wonder, wonder working and so forth? I mean, what, what influence did sort of this succession of cultures have on the, on the propagation of this knowledge? Julia? Yes. Um, it's, it's quite hard to answer that kind of question without like really falling into stereotypes and making things sound much more black and white than they, they were. And, um, and often you'll hear, oh, the, you know, the, the evil Romans came and like, you know, ruined everything. Um, but, but I think it, it is true that um, this definitely came from the Greek and Babylonian traditions and the Romans didn't really build on that. And I don't think it's a coincidence that there are a lot of lines of evidence kind of linking this to work on roads because that was one of the few places at the time that was still relatively independent and sort of hadn't been taken over by the Romans. Um, so I think they kind of, the Romans would have maybe appreciated this and, yeah, wanted to buy it or take it to show to their friends, but 
it's quite likely that this might have been the height of it because of the time when this happened. There wasn't really much time left then after the Romans took over. It never really got built on any further. Um, so, losing my thread slightly. But yeah, so I, I think definitely, I mean, who knows what would have happened if the Greeks had been able to sort of build on that. And Arthur C. Clarke, um, one of the things that he said about this was, because he saw in this the beginnings of the kind of technology that led to, ultimately to the Industrial Revolution when it was discovered much later. So he was saying, wow, you know, imagine if they had been able to build on this, you know, by this time, this is 1960s he was writing, we wouldn't just be going to the moon, we would be going to the stars, you know, we could have had the Industrial Revolution in 400 AD. Um, mm -hmm. Not all historians would really necessarily agree with that because there are so many different factors coming together. Um, but it's definitely one that's interesting to think about. Jim, did you want to build on that? Well, not to be too tough on the Romans, but they did, they did swipe a sundial from the Greek settlements in the south of Italy and took it to Rome. But it was 40 years before they noticed it didn't tell proper time at that latitude. <laughs> And if Caesar had known, he would have shown up later at the forum. Who knows? Do you want to wrap it up for us and give us the epilogue and the last invitation out to the bookstore, the gift shop, and beyond? Let, let, let me thank our panel very much for, for a, a wonderful discussion. And please join us and the three panelists uh, up on the cafe terrace for a reception. And uh, of course, the bookshop is still open. Jim. So. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Thank you.